Thank you very much, Brother Parker. Good evening, friends. It's good to be here tonight again. And uh, I guess you're tired sitting and listening at me, and I got, I got so tired. Um, horse, a little horse from preaching so hard. I'm just talking to Brother Parker there and telling him that I believe this is one of the best meetings that the Lord has let me be in for a long time. It's um, hasn't been big, you know what I mean, oh, but uh, it's not too big. There has been too many attending it, but the, the, the quality of it has been wonderful. Faith, my, it looks like anything could happen. I like that kind of meeting where you just feel like it, just anything can happen at any time. And I, I like that. And I'm sure there will be a lasting results, and it will show itself up. I certainly uh, admire your all's patience, sit and listen to me preach for hours, and then come back the next night. You sure can stand a lot of punishment. <laughs> so um, I know you got a lot of good patience. So we are, I want to say for all of us that we are grateful to you. The breath, Brother Thomas, I just can't express my feelings for Brother Thomas. He, I thought I knew him, but I had him mixed up with someone else. I got to shake hands with his precious little wife, and a really a servant of Christ. And I certainly hope that, God willing, that our paths will cross many more times than not. If I was you people that lived around here, this church would be the place I'd be going. So I, I like a man that's... I hate to interrupt Brother Branham like this, but I think it'll be all right on this occasion. I uh, thank him for those compliments and those nice things he said. But I just wondered if the people around here and all intending this convention would like to have him to come back again. What about that, huh? Everybody knows. In fact, would you like him to come back next June? And, and, and just sit with us? If you do, stand on your feet. Come on. Thank you. All right, be seated. Thank you very much. That's really nice. Thank you, Brother Parker. I'm so very... So that all expenses was paid and everything. We appreciate your all's fine cooperation and help because you know it does cost to have these conventions and so everything's paid up. That's very fine. We're just thankful everything in and above. The Lord is saved, healed, and everything's taking place. So we're just happy to be what well, see this hate to see this meeting go into history, but it'll come up again in the way back in the times to come. We'll see the results. Now, um, we want to thank everybody again for, I want you for little gifts that you sent to me during this time. I appreciate that very, very much. And now, um, uh, we're going now down to visit Brother Big B at uh, South Carolina, Columbia, Columbus, South Carolina. And we're to be there tomorrow night and Tuesday night with Brother Bigby. Then we're going over to the West Coast. I want to ask you, and then from there, I suppose, if we finish up this campaign up there, I want to go to Africa, Australia, New Zealand, and through there. Can I solicit your prayers for me that God will help me? And thank you very much. And we are very grateful for all things. I say that for myself and for the people that's here from the tabernacle. I've got our, some of our trustees here and um, deacons and some of my friends from down there. Our pastors here, I've never been able to see Brother Neville. I guess he's been introduced now. Yeah, Brother Neville. Where are you, Brother Armand? I just can't make you out of Oh, no. Back there, just as big. Come up here, man. This man I know to be a true servant of Christ. 
He was a died the wool Methodist and then received the Holy Ghost. <laughs> now he's the Holy Ghost Methodist. <laughs> This is our precious pastor. I want to shake your hand, brother. Yeah. God bless you. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you. I've known Brother Neville for years, Amen. and I, his lovely little wife, even before they were married, and I, the years of, that I've known him, he's never changed one bit, only just went higher than God. Amen. That's all. Amen. But he's dependable. We love him down at the pastor. He's been there for years. And we hope he stays till Jesus comes. And hey, Lord. Would you just like to say a word to the people, Brother Neville? Well, I am certainly delighted to be here in company with this good man of God that's been my privilege to associate with for this ten years. I don't know whether I've made a good Gehazi or not, but I've tried to carry the staff of this man of God. He's more than a friend to me, he's uh, been, as it were, a father in the gospel for me also, even though I exceed him a few years in age, but yet I'm so delighted also to be in this meeting. I, something got a hold of me down here in Southern Pines that I like this place real well, and uh, I've enjoyed it immensely. I know that God had a hand in my being able to come here and be with Brother Branham in this meeting. So I've been delighted so much in being here that things have just worked out so convenient and so wonderful that I just can't praise the Lord enough tonight for all of this. But above all, I said when I came here, there is one thing that highlights the whole meeting for me, and that's this Word of God. Amen. I wouldn't, if I never see a person healed, if I never see anybody pray for the sick, if God just continues to give me His Word. There's delight that fills my soul and comes from the bottom of my feet to the top of my head. This word of the Lord. And amen. I'm delighted that God has blessed us, our God's servant and prophet, and I felt the blessing come off of him onto me. So I'm glad I got to be here. I hope you all felt the same thing that I have in these services. God has really blessed his servant down here at this place, the reason I know that he expressed it a while ago. And great and mighty things that we have in faith tonight, Father, the Bible teaches us we don't need to have things visible. All we need is when we pray, believe, and we've already got them. Amen. Amen. I have them now because that's the way the Bible says it is. And I'm delighted in that because God is doing these wonderful things through this, our pastor, God's servant and prophet, Brother Branham, and may the Lord ever bless him and continue to keep him in this way. Praise the Lord. Uh, you know, when you go on a picnic, if somebody's stuck out a little tree somewhere where you can't, you don't know whether it's still there or not. See, because it's just set out, stuck out or something. But when you know there's an old oak that says stayed study, um, you pretty well can think about getting under that tree and resting. That's Brother Neville, just the same every day that's going on. So I'm so glad that we have, a, I have another brother here, a little a pastor or one of the sister churches of our church down there. If he doesn't come up, I would like him to stand up. Brother Junior Jackson, another Methodist, filled with the Holy Ghost. Junior Jackson, where are you, Brother Junior Jackson? Uh, Methodist, filled with the Holy Ghost. There he is, right here, Brother Jackson. You want to say something or anything you want to say? All right. Uh, another one here is Brother Palmer. Uh, another one of our brothers here. Would you just stand up, Brother Palmer, a pastor from down in Macon, Georgia? As one of our friends and Brother Fred Sotman, I know he's here. He's one of our trustees at the church. Where are you, Fred? Somewhere in here, sitting back in the back. Brother Banks Wood, where are you at, Brother Banks? And one of our other trustees over here. Brother Banks was a Jehovah Witness, you know, and he came into the meeting and he uh, had a crippled boy, David, his leg brought up from polio. Now I was in a tent meeting, and first he had saw the he was there at at Dallas the night or Houston 
when the Holy Spirit came down in that form of that light, and, uh, they took the picture of it. Brother Wood was there. So I didn't know him then. And so he got enough money together. He's a contractor. He come up to the next meeting. I went overseas from there and went to the next meeting. He had his crippled boy and with polio. And while we were, I was standing there under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. It goes back across the crowd, spoke to him, told him all about it, told him to stand up. David, where are you at? Are you here tonight as a boy that was crippled? That's him. David, if the people don't believe that God can heal a man that's got his leg twisted up with polio and things, I wish you'd just walk out there and just been show them how you, you can walk. <laughs> and here, just to, not to make a public show, but just a testimony. <laughs> not even a lip or nothing else, perfectly normal and whole. It's really, really wonderful what our Lord gave me. Now, if he'll do that for him, why well, he'll do it for someone else. Amen. It's just sure. It's just if we can get that type of faith. Amen. Now, of course, all of you are acquainted to know Brother Ben down here. He just, you know, this man that you hear above everybody saying amen. I'll tell you a little, I hate to say this on him. His wife's sitting there. We all love Ben. And um, uh, it was before he was married. I was out on the West Coast, and that boy's from Southern Indiana. I was out there on the West Coast just preaching away one night up in the San Fernando Valley, Valley with the Baptist people, big tent full of people, and I, they're kind of refined people, and you know, I was just preaching away. Directly I heard a squall, <laughs> black shock of hair shaking like, like, like a Mexican, two big feet sticking up in the air and hands like that. I stopped and I said, Ben Warner was you get out of here. <laughs> there he was. God bless you, Ben. You know more, just stand up. Just stand up, you and your wife. We just like for the people that, Brother Ben, that's who's been making all the amens down here in this corner. <laughs> God bless you. Brother, all your prayers, we trust to be going back into the missionary field for too long in the mountains, Brother Brown. Amen. God bless you. Brother Wade, another missionary, trying to get his way over into the mission fields. He's with us tonight. We know him. He's been so journeying down our way for a while. Where are you, Brother Wade? Are you in the meeting right here and his wife? And now I tell you, the war between England and Norway is settled. He's an Englishman and she's a Norwegian. It's all over. Lovely people. Yes, sir, the war is all over. Brother Bose was down the other night showing his picture. And saying, um, oh, well, he said, there's a woman, that's Sister Southman, and wished I'd have had her to stand up with Fred here somewhere, lovely people. And she's a Norwegian, of course, Brother Bose is a, is a Swede. And he said, <clears throat> you know how Joseph does. He said, uh, there's a lady here, a sister, said she's a Norwegian. said, of course, if you cannot be a Swede, it's good to be a Norwegian. <laughs> <laughs> Got outside, he looked over at me, and I said, of course, Joseph is too bad if we all came behind each other. <laughs> so we all have a sense of humor down there. Brother Higginbottom, where are you? He's around here somewhere. Huh? Another godly man from down our way. One who was a trustee of the church down there for years and years. And um, his friend, Sister Arden, right? Sister Ruth Arden, right? Right here. I believe she's sitting out here in the aisle. Stand up. How many knows mine are already right? The, one of the vice presidents, full gospel businessman, a cousin to him. All my life, I miss any of you folks. I, I'm proud of you, everyone. <laughs> I'm glad you're up here with us. We don't go going in and out. Brother and Sister Dow sitting there too, and Sister Brown, Brother Brown, Brother McKinney, another Methodist preacher with the Holy Ghost. Where are you, Brother McKinney? Where are you around here? He's from up in Ohio. You're way back here. Another full fledged barn in the. Shuck out Methodist, that's right. Now, baptism of the Holy Ghost, moving on for God. Pat Tyler, another bosom friend of mine sitting over here. Brother Pat, stand up. You all want to know Pat Tyler. Thank you, Brother Pat. God bless you. He was an outlaw, a gunman, killer. I'm saying he can make a saint out of him. Hitchhiking across the country to follow the meetings and things. You know, I think of these people, where they come from, I think of Hebrews 11 chapter, where Saul sundered and wandered about in goat skin and sheep skin, of whom the world is not worthy of. 
They all bear the testimony. Tom Simpson, where's Tom? Did he come up? I thought I seen his car out here. Uh, him and his family. Uh, Thought he was here. Maybe I was mistaken. Yes, Bob up and down like a bite on a fishing line out there. Boom, boom, like that. All right. The Lord bless you all. We're happy to be here. Here's others from Georgia, different places. And we're happy you're all here and to meet of our old friends. Am I looking at Sister Peck and Paul from um, Chicago? I thought I was. And Sister Little and next to her and, and Sister D'Amico. Precious, darling people from Chicago, that group of women, that's been very dear to me. In other setting here, the brother came to call his name, and uh, from down Georgia somewhere, I, all back, all my, they're just like, uh, all stuck around here. We're uh, glad to be in this fellowship. Yeah. Old brother Bosworth used to tell me, he said, Brother Ben, you know what fellowship is? I said, I think so. He said, it's two fellows with just one ship. <laughs> so there we are. So we have fellowship. Lord, be gracious to you. Thank you for all that you've done, and I'll put one of these, this meeting down on my list as one of the red marks of my days of ministry for your fine cooperation, these fine brothers and sisters, and everybody and so welcoming, feelings that just at home, till I preach myself hoarse. <clears throat> now, Brother Ned Iverson is going to continue the services after me down at, at um, Columbia's. Now with Brother Big, Brother Ned, are you in tonight? I don't know whether, yes, back in the back, a Presbyterian filled with the Holy Ghost. And uh, Dr. Lee Vale and his wife, precious, darling friends of mine, Brother Vale's worked with in the meeting, a precious friend. I guess these men have been all introduced to me. Are you here, Brother Vale? Are you in the building tonight? Back at the bank. That's the Lord bless you. Sister Vale, where are you at? I have no more got to wave at you. God bless you, sister. We're so happy to have them all here. And you all pray for me now. And I'm just moving on by faith, believing that most any time we might see the coming of the Lord. I don't know just how, when, where, but I want to be ready. And sometimes I might think it might be this way and I might be the other way. But anyhow, I want to be there when he comes. <laughs> I want to go with him. That's my ambition. And not only do I want to go, I want all my friends and I want all my enemies to go too. I want all everybody to go. And I had the little vision or I don't want to call it a translation. I never had a vision like that. I was standing up there looking at it, looking back at myself. Here recently, many of you read it in the magazines and things. Friends, you, you can't afford to miss that. Just don't do it. Now, the some were there. I was there, just as I am here, looking back at myself. Now, I've had visions. I don't know what visions are. And that was a vision. It was the strangest one I ever had. And I've seen the people, ones that's gone on. I've seen them there. The old was young. And they were standing there, human beings, just like I am, only without seeing. It was beyond perfection. Uh, sublime, you, you just couldn't mention what it was. And when I knew that I had to return back, there's only one thing that I would return, to try to persuade people, whatever you do, don't miss it. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. You can't afford to miss it. Everything else, let everything else go, but make ready for that. Make whatever you do. I'm be going in the mission fields now, if the Lord willing, this winter. When I get back off these trips, so be in prayer for me. Because here it's easy. Once in a while you see a foul spirit come into a meeting and try to disturb. But in them places, that's witch doctors and devils. You better know what you're talking about. Yes, certainly yes. am. Because there are demons and they'll challenge you right down. But all oh, how not one time I sit with my hand here at my Bible, not one time, and you you can imagine how many times around the world has been challenged by what God moved in on the scene and pulled the curtains back and showed himself God just the same as he was in the life of God. Not one time. That's the reason I, some of you, some ministers come and ask me to come to their places. I wait till I feel led to go. Then when I come, I'm just coming in my own name if I come like that, just to be your friend. But when I feel led to come, then I can come in the name of the Lord Jesus. Set your feet off that plane, she belongs to you. 
Amen. I take it all over in the name of Jesus Christ. And you're the meeting out there then because you're a God's ambassador then. But now when some church sends you or some friend calls for you or something, you're just going pursuing again. <laughs> My pursuing. I guess you'll be tired of listening to that. Now, let's turn in the gracious old Bible. And before we do that, let's pray. See, we're talking and, and so forth. And now let's center our minds around him now for the next few minutes. Our Heavenly Father, we were thanking the people for their kindness and their great, generous feelings towards us and how we appreciate that. And now, Father, we are, want to thank you above all, for it's you, Lord, that did this. It's you that's blessed us. And let us set together in the heavenly places in Christ. Satan would have disturbed and a, a ruined our meeting. But you just loved us so good, you just let us all gather together and have fellowship around the word. And we so appreciate it, God. Even though being a little hoarse from strain of voice, Lord, I just had such a wonderful time. Feeling your spirit blessing my soul, the word just we're not wanting for a thing, just flowing like rivers, but I just have to sit down. God, I'm so grateful for that. And may our brother Parker and all of his staff and this place that invited us, Lord, may they be blessed. Give them thousands of souls. Here when they pray for the sick, hear their prayers, Lord, and heal the sick. And when they're uh, trying to do something in your name, honor it, Lord. Give to them the fruit of the Spirit and, the, and give them the great desire of their heart, Lord. Souls farther high. May on that day when we stand there before you, may the souls come from everywhere throwing their arms around this precious godly man and his staff. If we had to stay on the field, Brother Parker, we wouldn't be here. Oh, God, we know that's the sincere desire of any true servant of Christ. Know that they can lead poor lost human beings to a saving Christ. Thank you for it all. And now, Lord, we pray now that you'll bless each one and bless the meetings coming up everywhere. Go with every home. Be with them as we leave tonight to go to our different homes. Be with us on the road. Stay on the wheel. Keep the enemy away from us, Lord. And I pray that you'll grant these things. Now, give us the desire of our hearts, every request tonight. And mine is, Lord, that you'll break the bread of life to us again tonight. If there's any here not saved, save them. Any need in the Holy Spirit, in the baptism may have come tonight. Any sick, heal them. Any weary, give them joy. Grant it, Lord. Bless your word now as we read it. May the author give us the context. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. St. John, first chapter, 35 to 41. I'd like to read these precious words. And again the next day after Jesus stood and two of his disciples, pardon me, after John stood and two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. And two disciples, the two disciples, heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and saw them following, and said unto them, What seek ye? They said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted, Master. Where dwellest thou? He said unto them, Come and see. And they came and saw where he dwelt, and abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two which urged Jesus or John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first finds his own brother Simon, and said unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. 
And he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. Now may God add his blessings to this word. Now I want to draw tonight, if the Lord willing, for a little, for a, a word, two words I want to use out of there. The word, two words I want to use is concerned and convinced. Now, as we know, and we all do that, we are now seeing a great cooling off around the nations. I first started out, there's a lot of tinsel on the meeting. People were in prayer meetings everywhere. Criticized, papers criticized me. One woman drove 3,000 miles in a taxi cab just to get to the meeting in Canada. They're not that concerned anymore. It seems like that there's become a falling away. And it um, seems like there's not much concern, not too much anyhow, as not as much as they should be. Very little concern. Now about the only concern that we have is not them all night meetings when I, I stayed at the platform once for eight days and nights not leaving trying to pray for all the people, and at the end, there were 40-something thousand people waiting to be prayed for. They couldn't do it. But uh, they would take a group this way and go into the woods, and take a group this way and go to the woods, ministers, praying the people through to the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Just couldn't rest until they received the Holy Ghost. Beg your pardon, I said 42,000, I believe if you look at it in the magazine, there was 28,000 it was, that were still waiting. For miles around Jonesburg, there wasn't even a place that you could rent and tent cities up and everything. They're not that concerned anymore. The, the revival fires are dying down. Concerned is now, just come and join the church. Or a great concern is support some radio mission or some television affair and making it some kind of show. And um, uh, for the good, of course, or big buildings, building great schools and so forth like that. It seems to be that is the, the concern now. Kind of lost the vision of that prayer and constraining and, and like they used to have. Is something has happened. I would just like to know what it was. And now, they don't seem to be concerned about you can dismiss church or call for people to come to the altar. And it used to be they would just run to the altar. Now I've seen the time while I was preaching, before I could even get my sermon finished. The altar and up and down the aisles would be lined with people. I've seen the time that the Holy Spirit would move out into the audience and, and predict and tell somebody something. And the people would marvel and just paint right in their seat. There's something wrong somewhere. Still doing the same thing. Still the same gospel. I've never changed a bit since I started. I just started with the naked, bare word of God, and I've stayed right on it ever since. Thirty-two years I've been behind the pulpit and never taken anything back or changed anything. Maybe this is the way I started. I can't take it back. It's God's word. And, uh, and if I say it just like it said here, the next time I have to say the same thing, goes, here's what it's wrote here, see? So just can't do nothing else about it. And the Holy Spirit's still doing the same thing. So, but it looks like there's not enough concern. Now, I wonder why. Why isn't there a concern like there used to be? It's, I believe the reason that if there's not as much concern as there used to be, they're not as convinced as they used to be. You have to be convinced before you can be concerned. 
not concerned, you take the time now, instead of evangelizing and trying to do something, everybody wants a great big school, or a great big something, that they can teach and, and make uh, ministers have better pulpit manners, and so forth. You know what I believe? I believe that the people is not convinced that Jesus is coming soon. I don't believe that they're convinced that he's coming in this age. And I believe that's the reason that they're not concerned because they're not fully convinced. Right. They're not convinced that he's with them. If they were, they would come back to the Word. Right. And now, many people might misunderstand it. Love, love is, is disciplined. You must discipline people. If you love them. If your little girl was sitting out in the road, as I said this morning, making mud cakes, if you really love her, you'd get her off that road. What if your wife said, uh, John, somebody, whatever your name is, you know, uh, uh, you just let her run out with some other man because you said, bless her little heart, she wants to do it, and I just love her so much, I'm going to let her do it. You'd be a poor excuse of a husband. She ought to get rid of you and get somebody that loves her. I'll take care of her. I didn't mean it that way. Because you can't do that. But what am I trying to get at is this. That what if God would say to Eve, poor little Eve, you know, you're my child. I, 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 you didn't mean to do that. Of course she didn't mean to do it. Certainly she, but she did it. And we know she did it. We see the results of it yet. But you see, he, he loved her and he, he had to keep his word to her. And God's got to keep his word to us. So we must obey his word. And when we obey his word and see him then vindicate what he said he would do, then we are convinced right, that the word's right. Now, when we find out we bring here not long ago a great evangelist to a Mohammedan. You read it in the paper? Like I did. This Mohammedan challenged that evangelist. That Jesus Christ was a man worship. That people were following a man. He believed in the same God that the evangelist did, but said Jesus is not his son. It's just a man made worship. And the evangelist challenged the evangelist, said that the Bible said, that the works that he did, Christ, his followers would do the same. He said, now, I'll bring in 30 sick people, and you bring in 30 sick people, and I'll heal everyone you do. See? And the evangelist run. Amen. He took air. Amen. And if I would have been the evangelist, I believe, if I didn't have enough faith to do it, I'd have never let that unbeliever stand there. I said, I know somebody in our limbs has got faith to do it. Why? Wow. You've got to be convinced first that it is God. Then you know where you're standing. It's true. Convinced first. Then you get your concern. Although people claim God's with them, but there, as my old mother used to say, Action speaks louder than words. <laughs> Certainly it does. You must act it, believe it, be convinced, and then you'll be concerned. <clears throat> Jesus said, if you love me, feed my sheep. Now that's where I think we fail a lot, is feeding your sheep. If you love me, feed my sheep. Today it's almost sheer machine. <laughs> Get them into a place and take everything they got and make them pledge their home and all their old age pensions and everything else. Talk about a shearing. 
Jesus ever said that. Amen. Brother Parker said this morning, God loves his people. Amen. He loves his sheep. Yeah. He said, feed them. Amen. And sheep must have sheep food. Amen. And he never said, educate my sheep. Amen. He said, feed them. Not educate them. Feed them. Give them sheep food. What is sheep food? The bread of life. Amen. Jesus is the bread of life. Gospel, truth. Amen. Preach it without compromise. Then you know that when you have to answer at the day of the judgment for their soul, as a minister of the gospel, you can stand and say, that's what was wrong in the word. Feed them the truth. Feed my sheep. When John was so concerned that he knew that the Messiah was coming in his age, John the Baptist knew it. So he knew that the Messiah would come in, in the age that he lived in. But when he come out of the wilderness, he never started no schools. He never started no colleges. He never started no organizations. Amen. Why? Well, he was convinced that the Messiah would come in his time. Amen. His fruit, his message, his action gave witness to it. And we believe that he's coming to this age. Why do we want to hoard up big things? Why do we want to do build millions of dollars in schools and buildings and then saying Jesus is coming? Why the public knows better than that? They know you're talking about something that you don't believe. Practice what we preach. Right. Now we must do that. John was so positive. When he was born, he knew he was born an odd birth. We all know how Zachariah saw the angel. And that must have been a strain on the old couple. Zachariah was an aged man. And Elizabeth was an aged woman. But they had believed that, that God would someday give him a baby. She was barren. And we know when John was born, the peculiar birth and knowing that he would be God's servant must have been hard on the old couple. For they know, according to the time of life, they would never live to see that boy come into his ministry. And John's father was a priest. But instead of him, with that calling, going down to the seminary where his father come out of, he couldn't go down there. He could not take a chance on it. He just couldn't get mixed up with it. Because he seen that in the scripture, he was to be the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Amen. He saw that he was to be the messenger that would go before the Messiah. Amen. And he must be certain of it. Amen. And he waited in the wilderness until he was convinced. And then he was concerned. Amen. Amen. He was convinced. He wanted to, he wanted to stay. He was so certain of it that he would see Jesus until he said this. There, he's standing among you now. There's one among you who you don't know. Oh, I like that. There's one among us tonight. But I'm glad we know him. Not being he's the one that's bearing record. The great Holy Spirit is bearing record. That Jesus is coming soon. For it's according to the word that all the signs are being fulfilled. We are at the end now. He didn't want to stay in, make any mistakes. So he stayed in the wilderness until he was convinced that he would know what the Messiah was. And God told him what kind of a sign to look for. When he saw the Messiah, so when he saw him and saw the sign that was supposed to follow him, he was convinced that that was he that I bear record of 
that's him. Amen. For God, who had told him and foretold him by the prophet 712 years before he was born, he was the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord and make his path straight. And the God that had foreordained and predestinated him to the child, he waited on that God till he heard from that God. Amen. Amen. And when that God told him what was going to take place, he was convinced when he saw that sign that there he is. Amen. 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 If we would just be that sincere. If we would wait at the altar, not get some kind of little feeling and jump up and run away, but stay there. No matter what happens, stay there until you're perfectly convinced by the power of his resurrection that the Holy Ghost has took a hold of you and holding you, and you're a new creature in Christ. Stay there until you're dead and raised up again. Then you won't go to water a hypocrite. You go there, you know that he's, he died for you and you died with him. Now you're going down to be raised with him again. Show the world that you believe that he died and rose again and you're dead with him and it's already raised again. Now you're going to sit in heavenly places eating sheep food. <laughs> Andrew, this great one that we're speaking of, the brother of Simon, he stayed all night until he was convinced as he's going along the bank. John, this great prophet, kept saying, there's one, the time is at hand. All you generations of snakes in the grass, don't think to say, I belong to this and I belong to that. We have Abraham to our father. I'll tell you, God's taking these stones to our children of Abraham. Or he would just lay into the axe to the root of the tree. See, John was a wilderness man. Look what he talked of, axes, trees, snakes. <laughs> See? That's what he's used to out there in the wilderness. And he said the axe is laid in the root of the tree, and every tree that don't bring good fruit is going to be cast down and burnt. Hitting the axe against the tree, cutting off snakes' heads and everything. He was a wilderness man. No wonder Jesus said, why would you go out to see? And that forgotten beatitude as a priest on it. When he went across the hill, uh, disciples of John said, why did you go out to see? A uh, man dressed in fine clothes. He said, that's the kind that uh, they're called Dr. Holy Father. They uh, wear soft clothes and they kiss the babies and marry the, the young and bury the old. He handles a pen knife. Why would a man like that go about a two-handed sword out on the battlefront? Did you go out to see one? So I said, then did you go to see a reed shake with any wind that any little group can come along changing from this to that and this to that? Not John. Amen. He was convinced. Amen. He knew where he stayed. He knew his position. Amen. Wasn't shaking John around. Amen. So what did you go to see then? A prophet? He said, no, I say to you, greater than a prophet. Amen. More than a prophet. So John was convinced, and he began to preach, and Andrew had been attending the meetings. And so when Jesus passed by, and Andrew and another disciple was there, and John pointed out and said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And they followed him. Amen. I wish I could have that much force in my preaching when I say Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world and every person to take out after him. Wow. Let me, where do I find him, Brother Burnham? I can show you. Amen. I long ago I was in a businessman's meeting. And I was preaching out on the West Coast. And the son fella walked up to me and he said, uh, Say, aren't you a preacher? I said, Yes, sir. I said, what are you doing with these businessmen? I said, I am a businessman. And he said, uh, what kind of a business are you in? I said, assurance business. He said, what kind of insurance? I said, assurance. So what kind of is it? I said, blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. 
I said, if you're interested in a policy, I'd like to talk it over with you. <laughs> Hallelujah. A friend of mine, Mr. Snyder, precious boy, he come up to my house and I knew him when I was a little fella and we went to school together and he said, Billy, I would like to sell you some insurance. Well, I, I had a little deal pulled to me one time on insurance and I'm never going to take it anymore. So he said, uh, I said, Wilmer, I, I sure would like you, but I said, I, I already got assurance. He said, oh, you have. My wife looked at me as if I was a hypocrite. She knew I didn't have any insurance, but I said, assurance. He said, oh, I'm sorry, Billy. He said, what company is it with? I said, the eternal life. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 I don't think I ever heard of that company. I said, you should. <laughs> oh, I'm convinced that it's right. Amen. It's right. So, John preached and said, there he is. The Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And I see him move across an audience. Poor sinner or sick person, speak to him and know that that's the very God. And anybody would know anything would know that I couldn't do that. I'd like to say, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Like when people say, I believe that I now repent of my sins. I believe on Jesus Christ. Oh, how I'd like to see him do that. And these disciples took right off after Jesus. And he looked around and he found them. And he said, what seek ye? And they said, Rabbi, the interpreted master, uh, what dwellest thou? He said, come and see. Now that's a wonderful invitation. Come and see. I like that. That's what Philip said to Nathaniel. When the finger said, could there be any good thing come out of Nazareth? He said, come and see. So, eh? Come find out. Don't sit at home and criticize. Come find out. Come see for yourself. Now, they said it was evening time, so Andrew stayed all night. Oh, that's a good way. He stayed until he was convinced what that man had told him that night, what he had said to him or what he did, there was something that completely convinced Andrew that he was the Messiah. The next day, real early, I imagine, he grabbed his coat and hat and tucked down because Peter was going to be fishing down the river and he said, come see who we found. It's the Messiah. He was convinced. When he was perfectly convinced that it was the Messiah, he was concerned about his brother. Amen. That's what's the matter tonight. People are not convinced of the message. People are not convinced about the Holy Ghost. If you really get convinced, then you're concerned. You'll do everything you can to do everything. What you got to do with it? You say, well, Brother Brown, I'm not a preacher. Well, you can do something too. Remember one time I had a meeting. There's a farmer, got saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. And he only had nothing but his experience and a truck. But he hauled so many to the meeting, he got 30 more filled with the Holy Ghost before time. <laughs> wow! He was convinced. And when he was convinced, he was concerned. Amen. Little daughter got healed. Well, he had sick people every night, truck full of them, bringing from everywhere. 30 got the Holy Ghost. See, he was convinced that it was right, so he was concerned about somebody else. And we're, if we're convinced that Jesus is coming soon, we'll be concerned about our lost one. We'll be doing all we can to get the gospel out. Jacob stayed all night one night wrestling, that wrestling prince. He wrestled all night. He had been dodging Esau here and there. He scared to death of him. And he heard Esau was coming, he put his wife across the brook, went over on the other side and knelt down, and you know, God come down and got a hold of Jacob and they wrestled all night. Amen. So he, he wasn't completely convinced to start with, but time God got through with him, he was convinced. <laughs> yes, he stayed and held on until he was convinced that it was God. Brother, he wasn't scared of Esau then. 
across the river, and he was weak and limping. The worst time that he could be in, look like. He, is, he was the weakest he ever was. He'd been crippled and everything. But Esau said to him, Will uh, you uh, let me send an army along to help you? He said, I don't even need the help. <laughs> wow! He was convinced that the God that he had a hold of could take care of him. Hallelujah! People just do that. You can be convinced that the God that takes a hold of you shakes your heart, makes you a new creature in Christ Jesus. Let sickness, death, or anything else come along. You're convinced he can take care of you. I like that. Shamgar, the little fellow we talked about the other night, he was concerned about his family. Yes, he knew they were hungry. And the Philistines came up, a thousand of them, at least 600 or something, we six hundred of them come up the road. Our man, he was concerned about his family because they starved to death that winter. But he stayed there thinking and studying. What could he do? He stayed there until he was convinced that God keeps his promise. Amen. Now look what he can thought. I hear it. My father Abraham. Of whom I bury my body the mark of circumcision. Because that I believe Abraham was a man of God. He was convinced. He left his home. He left everything he had to serve God. I, upon the mount that day, when he offered up the ram instead of Isaac, God told Abraham, because you did this, your seed shall possess the gate of the enemy. Amen. That's right. Amen. Your seed, Abraham, I promise you. I swear by it. Hallelujah. Now you're religious. I swear by it. Abraham, your seed shall possess the gate of his enemy. Now, Shamgar can say, I am the seed of Abraham. And if Shamgar can think that being the natural seed of Abraham, what about tonight? And we are the royal seed of Abraham. You think I'm crazy? Maybe I am. Leave me alone. I feel better this way than if I had the other mind. Royal seed of Abraham. The church is the royal promise seed. If the natural seed could take that much courage, what ought the royal seed to do? With the, with the presence of the Holy Ghost just running around, showing his son. Glory! Sure. Sam God said, I'm a seed of Abraham. As you begin to think of it, God told Abraham, I believe it. That his seed shall possess his enemy's gates. There they are, marching through my gate. Just reached up, got a ox gold. <laughs> um, he didn't stop. He never waited to learn how to do it. He said, I waited. I'm the royal seed. I'm the seed of Abraham. I'm circumcised. So, you know, all these Christians are good warriors. They've been practicing a long time. I'll go down to the seminary and get my Ph.D. and LLD, and I'll learn how to do it. <laughs> I'll learn the catechism, <laughs> all the church rules. If he'd have done that, that's all he would have known anything about. Amen. Amen. Oh. Amen. He'd have only known that, and he couldn't have lived that he couldn't have matched the enemy. You can't match the enemy. I can't match it. But I remember I'm living under a promise. Hallelujah. That's all that is. Powers has been more than matched and conquered and cast down. I'm more than a conqueror right now. Not myself, but I'm in him who conquered him for me. Then get your ox gold. <laughs> Run that devil of doubt away from you. Yes, that I'm, I can't learn to duel. 
If he does, that's all he knows how to do. Just do it. That's all he could have talked about. Today, that's the way you try to do it today. Man said, I got a call in my life to be a minister. Well, now, son, I'll call up the bishop and I'll find out if I can let you go over to school and you can learn psychology and um, learn all these things. And about 10 years in the seminary might fix you up. That will, sure enough. Amen. Amen. It'll fix him up so he can't never get up no more. Amen. Hallelujah. What a difference that it is sending a minister today than it was at the first church. They didn't wait 10 years, they waited 10 days. Amen. If it takes you 10 years to be convinced, they could, was convinced in 10 days. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. You might be convinced about psychology, but you have to get theology. Amen. <laughs> Just ten days they were convinced, and then they were concerned about others. Some of them couldn't even sign their own name. The Bible said they were ignorant and unlearned, but they were convinced. Hallelujah. I don't care about the education. I'm convinced Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I'm convinced this is the Holy Ghost. I'm convinced He's a healer. I'm convinced He's a Savior. I'm convinced He's coming. I'm convinced this is that. I'm convinced. Believe it. They said, they're convinced. Something happened. They were convinced. Then they were concerned, if they're convinced. They were concerned about getting his word out to the rest of them. That was a good sign that they were convinced. They was concerned. They wasn't concerned about an education. Concerned about where they could say, Amen, just right. They wasn't concerned about what organization they belonged to or whether they had a fellowship card or not. They were convinced that all they needed was Him. And I'm the same way tonight. I'm convinced that all we need is Christ. We don't need a new mayor. We don't need new presidents. We don't need a new army. We don't need a new bomb. We need Jesus. That's all that they, that they was convinced about. And they also believed that he would, they were convinced that he, he would eat everything that they had to eat of. Are you that convinced tonight? That I'm convinced. No matter what comes before me, he'll mash it. No matter what comes before me, I'm convinced he'll take care of me. He said he would do it. I'll be with you even in you. To the end of the age. Take no thought for tomorrow, or take thought for itself. That's right. Just think of the day. God so clothed the field and the grass of the field, which today is, tomorrow isn't. And if he thought enough, and he, not even a sparrow could drop in the street without it being known about it, how much more does he know about our need? I'm convinced. That's the reason you don't see me begging for offerings and this, that. I'm convinced. If I stay with this Lord, God will stay with me. I'm convinced. Don't have to be given. It'll come some way. I, I, I just, just convinced. I believe it. I believe every word he said. I'm convinced that. I'm convinced he'll meet all the needs I have need of. I don't have to worry about it. And he was also convinced that they didn't need a bunch of psychology and all this other stuff to take. They were convinced that those that were pre- they preached to was all they needed would be what they had. That's the trouble up today. You're trying to poke other stuff into them, creeds and things like that. You've never been quite convinced that the Holy Ghost is right. That's all I have need of. That's all you have need of. That's all anybody else has need of. I was in Africa not long ago. Just trying to educate those people down there and the tribes. When you bring him into the white man, he takes a white man's sin. 
Got his own sin out there, tried to bring him in. He takes a white man's sin, then he's two full times more hell than he was to start with. The only one thing he needs, he needs Christ. Amen. Amen. Hudson Taylor. One time, you ever heard of Hudson Taylor, the great missionary to China? This young Indian boy, he got saved, said he had a call to the ministry. He come and said to Mr. Taylor, said, Mr. Taylor, should I take four years of psychology and different things that he should do and how long would it take to get my Bachelor of Art? Mr. Taylor said to him, said, son, don't never burn the, hat, the candle half down before you start out. No. That's what I think, too. Don't wait till the candle's half burnt down and some kind of a schooling and knocked into you. Some kind of embalming fluid. Don't do that. But I say, as soon as the candle's lit, start. I'm not trying to support ignorance. But here's what I mean. If you don't know nothing else, tell them how the candle got lit. That's all they have to know. Tell them what lit the candle. Tell them what's burning in there. Just tell them how it got lit. Let them get lit. They'll take care of the rest of it. Certainly. You don't have to try to go through all kind of great uh, words that you know nothing about to begin with and don't mean nothing as you know. See? Just tell them, glory to God, the Holy Spirit struck me and I'm a different man. <laughs> tell them how the candle got lit. Don't wait till it burns up. Then smoking that time. <laughs> Too many of them today. <laughs> Just tell them how it got lit. The blind man that Jesus gave his sight to if there's they, just such a fuss about. You remember when he passed by the disciples and said, Who sent him or his mother's father? Jesus said, Neither. But that the works of God can may be made manifest. And he gave him his sign. Here come all of the scribes and Pharisees up. And his father and mother were scared to death because they'd already said, If anybody listens to that Jesus of Nazareth, that prophet, you just give your letter from the church. You're excommunicated. They haven't changed it a bit. You listen to it? Anybody listens to him or goes to his meeting, you're just right off the church, right to begin with. You rub your name right off the book. So he went and got his father and mother and said, Is this your son? Said, yes, it is. He said, We know this is our son and we know he was born blind. I said, How did he get his son? He said, You asked him, he's of age. He said, Give glory to God, this man's a sinner. Why, he couldn't argue theology with him. <laughs> Certainly not. But there's one thing he didn't know. Amen. He was convinced that he could see. He said, well, he's a sinner. I don't know. I don't know what school he come from or nothing about it. But this is one good argument point I got. Yeah. Well, and I was once blind. I'm convinced that I can see. He told me, told me I could not listen to him. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Same thing with me. I once was blind, but now I see. Yeah. I once couldn't see this. I was a sinner. He opened my eyes. Or I was once blind. I now see. He had a good arguing point. Sure did. So much that they couldn't argue down. Why? He was convinced he could see. And he was convinced that he said it's a strange thing now. You fellow, you fellow, sure are the religious leaders of the nation. And you say you don't know from whence this man comes. And here he performs a miracle on me that's never been done in the world. That's a strange thing. Brother, I believe he's a pretty good theologian today. Amen. Why? He was convinced. He had something to convince him. He was blind. He could see. David. When he came up to Saul's army, Goliath on the other side. David was the smallest man in the bunch. Goliath was the biggest. Saul had been more of a match. Saul was about seven foot, I guess, or better. Maybe eight. Head and shoulders above every man in his army. And David was the smallest man there. And he was the only untrained man there. But brother, he was convinced. Say, <laughs> I'd like to look I am. Notice! He wasn't trained, he had no spears, he knew nothing about it, he was just a little ruddy guy, but he was convinced. And he was concerned about an army that called themselves the army of the living God. And he was convinced that God who had helped him in that slingshot. 
to kill a lion and a bear could certainly take that uncircumcised Amen. 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 He was convinced. Amen. Then he gets concerned about the army. No matter how much he's got, if you're convinced, then you're concerned. But you got to be convinced first. So he was convinced. I remember one night, real hot night, spooky all around, going to war. All the odds was way against him. And he prayed. He's laying out there under a mulberry tree. The army was already ready out there to meet him. He laid under this mulberry tree, and after a while, he heard something coming. He went on through the mulberry bushes and went on out to the way. He was convinced, brother. <laughs> no matter what the odds were, he was convinced that God went on before him. Man, if you can stand here tonight, no matter what's wrong with you, if you can feel that rushing wind of the Holy Spirit coming to you and saying, I am the Lord that heals all your diseases, I heal you now. If you can be convinced, brother, you don't care what the contact is out there. You already know it's going to happen. Certainly, he was convinced, and then he was concerned. Samson, standing before the Philistines with just a jawbone of a mule in his hand, he wasn't, he wasn't even armed, but he was convinced that the God had raised him up was able with that jawbone of a mule to kill these Philistines and he slew a thousand. The runaway prophet Moses. When Moses got convinced that it was God in that bush, <laughs> you know, Moses never had any experience with God, he had a lot of theology. But he'd run away. But when he was convinced that that was God in the bush, because a voice spoke from the bush, quoting scripture to him. And he was convinced that that was God, and God said, I'll be with you. You know, he lost all concern about the burdens in Egypt. He'd been out there 40 years and slave away. But when he was convinced that it was God's will to deliver him, he got concerned right the next day. Here he goes down the road. Could you imagine what a sight? With the zephyr setting on a mule, little Gershom on the hip, beards hanging down like this, 80 years old, bald head shining to the sun, a crooked stick in his hand, shouting, Hallelujah, going down to Egypt to take over. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> yes. It may make you act strange. It might have made him act strange, but he was convinced. Wow. I'm going with you, Moses. I'm going to take this stick that's in your hand, and I'm going to deliver my people. Now, a little old crooked stick didn't look very much, but brother, he was convinced because the word of God was with him. You know, God's word's with you and in you, you can be convinced. The Hebrew children, they were convinced that he was able to keep his word. Yes, as long as they would stand on it, God told them not to bow to idols. That's just exactly what God meant. And they knew that if they did not bow down to that idol, that God was able to keep his word. They were convinced that he was. And then when they were convinced about standing with his word, God was concerned about standing with them. When you're convinced that this is the word of God, God's concerned to take care of you. Amen. Try to see the farm fields and everywhere. Amen. When you're convinced that it's right, but you've got to be convinced, then God will be concerned with you. But first, you must be convinced that it's him and he keeps his promise. And God's concerned. Martha was convinced that if Jesus asked God, it would happen. She said, I don't care what any of the rest of them says. I don't care even my sister Mary don't believe. I don't believe, don't care what the rabbi says. But Lord, if you'd have been here, my brother would not die. And he said, even now, I'm convinced that if you ask God, God will give it to you. It'll happen. I'm going down that road with a stone. I'm going to make ready for it. I'm convinced. Sure. Remember my father down in Kentucky years ago, the crops was all burning up, and the old circuit preacher come through. 
And he was a dandy old man. When he went on his knees, he stayed there. Something happened. That day, they all going to pray for the rain to come. Pop said, that old man went on his knees. You see them old swiveled up hands went up in the air. He said, oh, God, I have served you. These people are yours and their crops are burning. Pop said he stepped out of the church and went out there and took the saddle off his mule. <laughs> Told during the church because he knows the rain was coming. <laughs> <laughs> Convinced! <laughs> yes, sir. Then he was concerned about his saddle. <laughs> After you get convinced, Martha said, if you'd have been here, my brother would not die. But even now, whatever you ask God, God will give it to you. That's right. It's going to happen if you ask God. Isn't that wonderful? Dries with a corpse in his house. His only child, 12 years old, a little girl. The message comes, don't trouble the master because she's already dead. And Jesus said, first he said to Jesus, my little girl is even now dead. But I'm convinced. Yeah. Hallelujah. Come lay your hands on her. She'll be all right. Yeah. Convinced. He had heard of Jesus. He knew his work. He was a secret believer. Down in his heart. He believed that that was the son of God. He was thoroughly convinced it was. You know, isn't that strange? God forced him to the issue. God knows how to force you. Amen. Right? Sometimes he gives you sickness and everything else just to force you to it. Show your color, what you are. Forced him. Dries was forced to believe it. So then he showed what he was. He said, if you'll come lay your hands on my girl, though she's dead, she'll live. Oh, my, like that. I think Martha said the same thing. Jesus was convinced of it, too. The Roman soldier, the centurion, he was convinced if he could only get Jesus to say the word. Listen to that soldier, Roman, Gentile, heathen. He said, I'm a man under authority. I say to this man, this soldier, you go here and he goes. And I say to this one, come and he comes. Why? He's all me. What was he testifying? Jesus you're over all diseases. You're over it all. If I can just hear you say the word, my servant will live. I'm thoroughly convinced. And then after all that, we still don't be convinced. What was it? Jesus said that was great faith. He didn't find that in Israel. Just speak the word. Here it is right here. When thou prayest, believe that you receive. What you ask for, and you shall have it. If you say to this mountain, be moved and don't doubt your heart, but believe that what you've said will come to pass, you can have what you said. Then confess. Wow. By his stripes I'm healed. By his grace I'm saved. By his promise I obey and I shall be filled with the Holy Ghost. There you are. If you're convinced that he keeps his word. But first you've got to be convinced. The woman with the blood issue. She was convinced. No matter what the rabbi said and what the priest said and what her husband said and what anybody else said, she said, that's a holy man. He's the son of God. And if I can touch the board of his garment, that's all I have to do. I'm convinced I'll get well. Though the doctor says she can't get well. But she said, I can get well. If I can just touch the border of his garment. She was convinced. The woman at the well was convinced that he was the Messiah when she'd seen that scriptural sign that she knew what Messiah was going to be. As I said this morning, that predestinated life lay in there. And as soon as she, it warm waters poured down, cool waters rather poured down upon that word of life that God had predestinated from the foundation world, she'd seen it quickly to that. When there was ministers there didn't see it. Priests that didn't see it. High priests didn't see it. Great clergymen didn't see it. Called it devil. And that poor little harlot out there, God had predestinated that from the foundation of the world. If you're ever there, you were for due. Now, the Bible said in the last days, the Antichrist would be so religious 
and so much like the real thing till it would deceive the very elected if it was possible. <laughs> but it's not. Right. And all, he would deceive all upon the earth whose names were not written in the Lamb's book of life since the last revival. That doesn't sound like the Bible, does it? From the foundation of the world! Yeah. And he's going to deceive them because they're laying right in that word. When they see those things appearing, it's life. They catch it right now. Oh, there's a walker. I say, oh, there's nothing to that. <laughs> see, they're not convinced. There's nothing there to convince them. Nothing in to believe with. Mother used to say, how can you get blood from a turnip when there's no blood in it? Right. My sheep hear my voice. They know the word. What is this voice? Here it is. These creeds, they don't follow. But they hear my voice, they follow it. The woman at the well was thoroughly convinced. Then she was concerned that her people would also see that sign and believe it. After she was convinced that that was the Messiah because he told her where her trouble was, she said, Sir, we know when the Messiah cometh, he'll do that. He said, I'm him. She knew a man that could do that thing would certainly be telling the truth. Yes, a man that God would use in that manner would lie. Right, he'll tell you the truth. Said, I am he. And she was so thrilled when that life broke through on that word. She ran into the city. She was thoroughly convinced whether she supposed to or not. She ran into the city and told them rabbis and priests and all the men in the street, the market man, up the ever grocery, up and down the street. She went testifying, come see a man who told me the things I've done. Take your Bible. Look in the scroll. Isn't that the truth that that's the very Messiah? She was convinced. She'll rise up in the judgment and condemn thousands of people out in the United States. And her she sure will. No, Jesus said, the queen of the south shall rise in the judgment. Condemn them. For she come to hear a gift of wisdom. What Solomon had a discernment. Instead of greater than Solomon is here. <laughs> sure. But still, the people wouldn't believe him. Sure. She was convinced. And she wanted her people to be convinced. See, after she was convinced, then she got concerned about her people. She knew that that was Messiah. She knew that's what the Bible said would happen when Messiah comes. She said, we know that Messiah, which is called the Christ, when he comes, he'll tell us them things. But you must be a prophet. Jesus said, I'm him. There she was convinced because she knew the scripture said so, and here it was. She was convinced. Then she was concerned. She wouldn't tell somebody else. Now, Jesus was convinced that he would raise up on the third day. He was so convinced, he said, you destroy this temple and I'll raise it up the third day. Why? David, in the scriptures, under the inspiration, a prophet. David was a prophet, you know. David, under inspiration, prophesied and said, I'll not leave his soul in hell, neither will I suffer my holy one to see corruption. And he knew that sometime within 72 hours before corruption set in that body, he would raise up. 72 hours and three days and nights. He said, destroy it. And I'll raise it up again. Thoroughly convinced. That's right. That he'd raise it up again. He knows the scriptures can't fail. Hallelujah. I'm convinced that he's the same yesterday and today forever. I'm convinced in the ministry and the message I'm preaching. Amen. I'm convinced that it's the truth. Amen. I'm convinced that these visions come from God. Amen. I'm convinced we're living in the last days. I'm convinced that this very spirit is on you now is the Holy Ghost. Amen. Oh, Amen. I'm thoroughly convinced. Amen. I'm convinced that the Holy Ghost way is right. I'm convinced that the Bible way is the truth. I'm convinced that this is Jesus Christ here now. I'm convinced if we believe him in this minute. I'm 
convinced that he'll heal every sick person in a moment of twinkle of an eye. I'm convinced he'd pour out the Holy Ghost up on here, though there'd be such a shock to it. I don't what would take place. Hallelujah. I'm convinced. Amen. I believe it. Yes. With all my heart. Yes. Not because I'm an old man. I preached this when I was a kid, not over 20 years old. Yes. I've been convinced since that day he met me on the river. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm convinced that he's here now. Amen. I'm convinced that killer fire is the same pillar of fire that was with Israel in the wilderness is the same pillar of fire with the church today. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday today and today. Amen. I'm convinced, perfectly convinced. That angel met me up there and told me what he did. I stood before heathens by the thousands and tens of thousands. I say, aren't you afraid? No, sir. Amen. I'm convinced that it come from God. Amen. I'm convinced because it was scriptural. Amen. I'm convinced that it's the angel of the Lord. I believe it with all in my heart. Uh, I'm convinced if we would ask God for anything, He'd give it to us. You're just scared. Don't be scared. He's here. I'm convinced that that very Spirit that you feel, the Holy Spirit that's moving in us, I'm convinced that that's Christ. Amen. Amen. I'm convinced that right now, that this is what I'm looking at, this circle of life before me, I'm convinced that's the Holy Spirit. Yes. Amen. I'm convinced that vision is over my eyes. Yes, amen. I know he is. I do too. Believe it. Amen. Believe it. Amen. Some of the devil in the world is ours. Amen. God. Yes. Christ is not just a prophet, he's God. Amen. Nothing short of it. Hallelujah. Let's bow our heads just a moment. I just can't preach a moment. Hmm. Such an anointing. Blessed be the name of the Thoroughly convinced that he's Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Heavenly Father, I'm convinced that you, I pray, God, that as I leave this platform tonight, that you'll do something special. Prove to the people once more that it's you. I commit this audience to you. Lord, bring your hands. Do with us as you see fit. In Jesus' name, amen. Something happened. I'm convinced that God is here. Did he give out prayer cards? Any prayer cards? No. We don't need them. I'm convinced that he's here. You believe it? If you're thoroughly convinced, say, Jesus, I touch you with the feeling of my infirmities. I believe that Brother Brenham has told the truth. He's just a man. You're God. But I believe he told the truth because it's a word. Let it happen, Lord. Let him speak to me and tell me. Make me convinced. Here it is already in the meeting. That lady sitting there, she's praying for a nervous condition, her little girl with her retarded. Go to believe it? Sick mother at home. Have faith, don't doubt it. 
You have what you ask for. I'm convinced that the same angel that come down in the form of a man and talked to Abraham with his back turned to the tent is the same one here tonight. He promised him to be. I believe that that same angel anoints us because it was God. Do you believe it? All right, Sarah. In here somewhere, you speak to God. I'm convinced, sister. I'm convinced, brother. I know it's the truth. It certainly is. There's a lady sitting behind me. She's got a heart trouble. She's sitting right behind me. I don't know her. She's standing in front of me. She's a middle-aged woman. She's not from here. She's from Virginia. Miss Fox? Jesus Christ makes you well. <laughs> She's sitting right in here. Let's see. This is her right here. Believe? You believe? If thou canst believe, all the things are possible. What do you think about it, lady? Are you and I strangers one another? You believe me to be his prophet? You do? You have a head trouble. That's right. Your name's Miss Moore. That's right. Raise your hand. Go home. Be healed. Are you believing? Now, someone appeared before me here. Here it is, someone. It's a woman. She's got cancer on the breast. Mrs. Rhodes? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know the woman. God knows it. Thou canst believe all things are possible. Right. A man sitting on a plane. Tulsa, Mr. Harwood, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Go be made well. Have faith. I don't know the man. I've never seen him in my life. We're strangers, but that's right. Why touch something? Are you convinced? Are you convinced that God keeps his word? If you are convinced. How many of you have a need? Now, surely, as a woman thought at the well, ask these people, go talk to them. Where are they? I see another one. Yes, another one. Listen, see if it's right or not. I circled the building, the whole building's anointed, the whole place. I'm convinced that the presence of Jesus Christ will heal every person here. Are you convinced the same? You convinced that I'll tell you the truth? God vindicates I'm telling you the truth? Then I command that you stand to your feet and accept your healing in the name of Jesus Christ. If you are convinced, raise your hands up to Him and give Him praise.